So, Revelation chapter 1. Today I want to give you, we're not going to jump into a ton of details of the end times and what that means for us, but today I just felt like I wanted to give you a bird's eye view of the book of Revelation. Some of us would approach the book of Revelation as this book of weirdness and mystery and hard to understand, and there are things like horns and seven beasts and harlots and, you know, all this weird stuff that's happening in the book of Revelation, and uh but the Bible clearly says that those who would read these words would be blessed. So I am far from an end times expert, but I'm going to take a stab at some things that I barely understand myself. But the more I pursue them, the more I understand them. And, and I just want to give you some insight into that. So I want to give us a bird's eye view, a quick, simple view, or in other words, revelation for dummies like me. Um, but it lays out, really, the book of Revelations, a simple outline, and that's found in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. And this is John, the disciple, and he is on the island of Patmos. He's there. It's kind of the uh, prison island of the day. They would send prisoners there, and it, the Bible says that it was the Lord's day, and suddenly John was taken into a vision, and he begins to see some things, and here's what the first thing that he hears in that vision, he said, write the things which you have seen. Everybody say seen. seen. The things which are, say are, are, and the things which will, say will, will, take place after this. And these are going to be our three main points today. The things you have seen, which has been, the things that are, which are happening now, and the things that will take place after this. So really, the whole book of Revelation is broken down into those three things, things that have been, things that are happening right now, and things that will be. The book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. Well, what is prophecy? In layman's term, prophecy is pre-written history, pre-written history. It's God standing in our now, what's on the horizon. But this is the book of Revelation, not the book of Revelations. It's important to know that. There's one primary goal, one revelation that the apostle John is trying to teach us, one thing that he's trying to unveil. That's what revelation literally means, to unveil something. He's trying to say that things that have been hidden, things that have been veiled, if you read this book, the veil which hid things will, will be discovered as you read this book. And I, I mentioned this a little bit ago, but Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Everybody say, the time is near. This is the only book in your Bible that has a promise attached to it in its reading. So even if what I preach today isn't great and I struggle to get out what I'm trying to say to you, which happens sometimes, and, you know, according to the Bible, you're going to be blessed either way because in just hearing the words of this book, you're going to be blessed. So just settle in because you're going to be blessed, <laughs> right? Uh, that I should preach from the book of Revelation more often because you'll be blessed either way. So... A little bit of more background on it. John the Beloved is the author. He counted himself as one of the best friends of Jesus. He actually was one of the only apostles to be standing at the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, and as he was there, he's standing there with the mother of Jesus, and he hears one of the last sentences that Jesus will ever say hanging from the cross, and that was, take care of my mother. He spoke this to John, and John takes on that mantle and oversees uh, Mary's care for the rest of Mary's life. Uh, so that's who the author of this book is. This book is special to our theology as Christians. And the best way I can describe that is Genesis would be considered the seedbed for all theology. What I mean by that? It's our understanding of God. We find that in Genesis. It's how we see God. It's how we Think about God. Can I tell you that the most important thing about you is how you think about God? Because if you think about God wrong, you think about yourself wrong, you think about the world wrong, you think about people wrong, you think about your situations wrong, right? But if you think right about God, you see yourself right, 
You see people, right? So the most important thing about a person is how they see God because it, it infiltrates in every other view that we have in life. That's why it's important that in all of our seeing, in all of our doing, we see God right. So Genesis is considered in theology the seedbed of our theology as Christians. Revelation is considered the harvest of all theology. Where Genesis describes the beginning, Revelation would explain our ending. Genesis teaches us about the very first bride who was Eve. Revelation teaches us about the church who is the bride of Christ. In Genesis, Satan would appear in the garden for the first time, and in Revelation, he will appear for the very last time time in human history. Come on, that's something to shout about. In Genesis, man is removed from the garden. They are removed from God's presence. And in the book of Revelation, man is ushered back into the full presence of God, having full access to all of his glory. So what God begins in the book of Genesis, he finishes in the book of Revelation. So Jesus tells John, I want you to write about the things which are seen. And John begins to write. And I want to read this in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. And this is John writing. He says, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one was like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. Their hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice was as the sound of many waters. He had in his right, his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His appearance was like the sun shining brightly. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. Then he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am he who lives. Though I was dead, look, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have kept the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Amen. That's good. So John begins to write about the things that he sees. And what I want you to take note of when we begin to talk about the book of Revelation is John does not write specifically about an event. He's not writing about a moment in the tribulation. He's not writing about the antichrist. He's not writing about the mark of the beast. The very first thing that he writes about this unveiling, the revelation that he has, it's it's about the person of Jesus Christ. There will be a lot of things in the book of Revelation that we may or may not understand, but the main focus of the book of Revelation is Jesus. It's not the event. It's not the tribulation. It's the person of Christ. He is the main focus of the book. So if we read the book of Revelation and we don't walk away and see Jesus or see Jesus more in in, in a fuller way, then we really miss the point of the book. Amen? Amen? So Jesus tells John, I want you to write them concerning the things which you have seen because the first time Jesus came, he was veiled. What you have seen. Remember, Jesus came. He was born of a virgin. He came and put on flesh. He dwelt among us. He was placed in a feeding trough. And as a child, he was raised in obscurity in Nazareth. He was raised by a simple carpenter. He was raised in this simple life. And really, we don't know much about the childhood of Jesus. We get a glimpse of him when he was about 12 years old. And his parents lost him and they found him in the temple. Um, But we don't really know much about the childhood of Jesus. And at the age of 30, he shows up uh, and begins his earthly ministry. After three years of ministering, we find that he's being arrested. He's being sentenced to execution. They put him on a cross. He carries that cross. He's crucified. And as he hangs there bleeding, embarrassed, and humiliated, they mock him as, you know, saying, hey, you're the king of the Jews. If you really are, why don't you, you know, get yourself down off this cross? And in church life, many people get stuck 
on their vision of who Jesus is. Why? Because twice a year we talk about the birth and we talk about the resurrection. Birth and resurrection. Birth, resurrection. It's a part of our literal calendar, right? But a lot of times people get stuck on their vision of who Jesus was and that's why it's so important when Jesus says to John, I want you to write what you see because who I was isn't who I am. And if people get stuck at where I was, they won't be ready for where I'm going. Because the fact of the matter is Jesus never did stay in a manger. Come on, somebody. And the fact of the matter is Jesus never stayed on the cross. And last week we celebrated that he got up out of the tomb, but the tomb isn't the end of the story. The Bible says that he stood in front of his disciples and was ascended up into heaven. And he said, I'm going here to prepare a place for you. Get ready because I'm coming back to take you. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. So Jesus saying, yeah, I came and I was veiled. I was in a manger. Yes, great. I came. I died on the cross, made way, made preparation. I got up from the grave so that death, hell, and the grave would never touch anyone who would call upon my name ever again. But don't stay there because that's where I was. That's not where I am, and that's not where I'm going. So he says, John, I need you to write about where I was. I need you to write about what you see so that people can clearly understand where we're going. Come on. Pre-written history. So it's important that in our theology and in our thinking and in our life, we, we, we don't just put Jesus in the box. Come on. He doesn't tell John, write more about the cross. Write about the empty tomb. He says, write about how you see me now. In church life, we say, well, when we get saved, we ask Jesus into our heart. And, you know, in my childhood mind, I picture this little Jesus man. And he comes and, like, sets up his little place in our heart. Actually, when we get saved, we're inviting the Holy Spirit into us who regenerates and awakens our spirit to new life. But Jesus isn't in our hearts. Jesus literally is sitting at the right hand of the Father in this moment. Victorious. King of kings and Lord of lords. So he's telling John, make sure the people know I'm not the beaten man on the cross anymore. I'm not the bloodied man being ridiculed anymore. I am now exalted and I sit at the right hand of God in this moment. See how I am today. So the first thing John does is he begins to unveil to us who Christ is today in this moment. How he's seated at the right hand of the Father, crowned in glory, crowned in majesty, reigning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So it's important that we get this vision when we think about Jesus and we think about what's happening now is that we understand where he is in the moment. I personally think we would live lives different if we understood, if we had that imagery, imagery, excuse me, in our mind when we go through trials. Come on. You can start going through something and you're picturing Jesus on the cross and you get your little crucifix out and... I don't really do crucifixes. Why? Because that was a momentary time where Jesus was ridiculed and and put on the cross to pay a price, but that's not where he is today. That's why he says, think on these things, things that are high, things that are lovely. Get your mind up, up. Why? We are seated in heavenly places with him. Why? Because where he is in the moment, he he is seated in the place of victory. There's another verse of scripture that says, you know what he actively does 24 hours a day, seven days a week? He makes intercession that the children of God's faith will not fail them. Who's the children of God? And he prays that our faith will not fail us. Question, has there ever been a prayer that Jesus prayed that did not get answered? So if he's praying that your faith won't fail you, there's a pretty good chance if you lean into Jesus where he is today, your faith won't fail. Come on, but the, the enemy tries to keep us blinded by that, and we just want to keep putting him back on the cross and back on the cross. He is victorious because of the cross. He defeated hell. He defeated the grave. All right. So it's really clear. Jesus tells John, he says, listen, I'm not going to return like I came the first time, where there was this veil of mystery some you know, people knew of the, the baby Jesus, but he, there was this veil of mystery. He was very hidden when it comes to you know, the knowledge of the world around. 
He won't be hanging and bleeding on a cross. He won't be mocked. He won't be wearing a crown of thorns. He says, I want them to know that when I return, I'm coming as the God with eyes like fire. Ready to make every wrong right. Ready to take my church. Ready to call my bride. Ready to defeat death, hell, and the grave forever. Come on. He goes on. And he says, write those things that were and write those things that are. That brings us to what we would call in the book of Revelation, the church age. Everybody say church age. Church age. Book of Revelation begins to talk about the church age or this time period where the church is on the earth. And we'll break this down over the next several weeks of what that really means in, in, in scope of when Christ can, could return and, and where we are in that timeline. But today, again, we're just taking this overview of the book of Revelation. But we begin to see the church age happen in, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And it begins us to walk us through some things. And Jesus says, listen, I want you to say some things and write some things to the churches. There are, at that time, seven churches in what was known as Asia Minor. And he lists these seven churches that were physical churches that existed. Physical church buildings, physical uh, groups of people that they would consider a church existed. But I want us to know today that that was symbolic of the church at large. Because here was what we like to do. We like to read the warnings to the churches in Asia. And we like to say, oh yeah, that church down the road that I used to go to, they're, yep, they're that church of Philadelphia, man. They just, you know. And we like to say, well, let, let's, let's put that on that building and that building and that building. But, but really, in every church, I think there are all seven churches. Because we are the church. It's never been about a building. But what he's really saying is, listen, as the end times come, there are going to be certain temptations, certain weaknesses, certain tendencies and behaviors that will try to get a hold of the heart of my church. And then he gave us, you know, this, this physical example of this church and this church and this church, but that's not what we're supposed to run around and do and judge what every other church is doing. He's saying, look within yourself because probably within you, you can find two or three of the churches, some temptations, some weaknesses that we would have to struggle with during the church age, some things that we would have to work through. So let's be careful not to just place this on a building. Right. He's writing to you. He's writing to me. He's writing to us. So real quickly, and I mean real quickly, I promise I'm going to go through these churches. The first church, he says, the church of Ephesus he says, listen, they've lost their first love. How many of you know a building can't lose its first love? Again, driving home the point, he's not talking about a building. He's talking about the condition of the hearts of a group of people. He's talking about those who do not love him like they used to love him. He's talking to some people where he says they just don't place him first anymore. They don't love him like they once did. Let me submit to you, if there has ever been a time in your life where you feel like you were more passionate and in love with Jesus than you are right now, then this word is for you. He says, don't lose your first love. Come back to your first love. In the end, in the last day, there will be this temptation for people to fall out of love with Jesus. And listen, he's saying they lost their first love. It doesn't say they still don't love him. They just lost the first love. What that means is a whole lot of other things crept in along the way, and Jesus is on the list, but he's not first. Try that in your marriage sometime. Come on, as a married person, your spouse should be first. You got problems if it's everything else along the way. And that's what Jesus is warning this church. He's saying, listen... You've let other things creep in. You've let circumstances creep in. You let the love of the world creep in, and you've lost your first love. Number two, the church of Smyrna. He says this is a fearful church, a worried church. This church was primarily concerned about the future. We have to be careful when we open up the book of Revelation. For many, it will spark fear in the hearts of the church. Actually, John says, I write these things to encourage you. The book of Revelation is supposed to encourage the church. 
Like when he's talking about dragons coming out of the sea with like heads and horns, we're supposed to be like, yeah, this is good stuff for me. I don't understand it, but what it means is God is making every wrong right. And for those who are on God's side, we will stay on God's side. Come on. The only worrisome is for those who have walked away from God's side. And hopefully if you've done that, God's calling you, get yourself back together, get yourself back on God's side, stay on God's side. But this church was a worried, fearful church, primarily concerned about their future. Come on, and sometimes when we hear things that are happening in the world and we hear of the end time events that are happening and social unrest in our world, specifically here in America, a divided nation, and we begin to get worried about our future. But I want to help you out. The way it all winds up is the world will continually get messier and messier and messier and messier. It doesn't get better and better and better and better. But yet he still looks at the church and says, for you there's nothing to fear because this is the revelation. He's the beginning and the end. And he will always stand and fight and protect and guard his church. This isn't scary to God. The church will always be its brightest when the world is at its darkest. As sin increases, grace much more increases. We can actually find this proved throughout history in any great revival that has happened, like even in places like China where the church is forced to go underground. The, the charismatic Pentecostal church is exploding, has been exploding for years in China. Why? Because any time the church is persecuted, those that the Bible says he, he sorts the, the tares from the wheat, the, the, he, he sorts those who are just going through the motions from the real church. And whenever the church gets persecuted, those who were just hanging on fall off and the real church gets invigorated and we begin to share the gospel with boldness and with power and it, the demonstration of the spirit of God comes in alongside of us to prove the gospel and all these great things begin to happen and the church begins to increase. Any great persecution of the church has always been married with the greatest revivals of the church age. So as the world gets darker and darker, it's a great age for the church. Signs and wonders and miracles happening. Come on. So we have nothing to fear. We won't be a fearful church. We won't be a compromising church. We won't be a worried church. The third church, I'm just going to I'll say, you know, I'm not great at all these church, these church name words, but Pergamum is what I think is how it's pronounced. It, they were known as a compromising church, a compromising church. Now, what's interesting about this is they love God. He clears that up as he begins to write. They love him, but they lack integrity. And he talks to them about how critical it is that they overcome the temptation to become like the world. He says, you can love me, but you also have to live for me. Again, we're not talking about a building I think we can all find some of this in each of our hearts. You can love me, know about me, go to church, but not actually live for me because it's not good enough to know me in a church service, but he says, I need you to bring me into your Monday. I need you to bring me into your Friday. I gotta be there when you're putting your kids to bed. I gotta be there when you're making breakfast in the morning because if I'm not in your whole world, you've lost the power of the gospel. He says, I appreciate that you love me, but I need to know that you will live for me. And he says, listen, if you live for me, I'll give you a new name. I love that he says this to this church, that I'll give you a new name. Because in the book of Revelation, we find that, and we'll get into this in another message, but as we, many of us have heard, the mark of the beast but is a number. And I love that when it comes to the mark of the beast, we are assigned a number. Because when you lean into the kingdom of darkness, you will only ever be a notch into the belt of the kingdom of darkness. You're just a number. But he says, listen, when you know me, I'll write your name. I'll give you a new name. And I'll write it in the Lamb's book of life. And I'll call you my own. I'll know you personally. You're not a number to God. You're not forgotten of God. He says, when you lean into the kingdom of light, I'll give you a new name. I will know you face to face. Not a number. Not just, you know, something to build a... a false kingdom on, but he says, I will make you family. 
The fourth church, he says, they were unrepentant. They justify their sin through good works. This is scary because it introduces us to the idea that we can just be a good person and that would get us into heaven. If I'm good enough, it'll balance out the scale of justice. How many of you know that's a real thing, invading the church, even in the world? Well, I'm a good person. And my goodness, I'm at one with God, the creator being. It doesn't matter if you're good, you still were born into a life of sin. And Jesus said, I am the only way to heaven. The fifth church, he says they were a, uh, this is the church of Sardis, they were a dead church. Dead church. It's interesting that there are churches that he says will have my name and they will look like they're alive, but they're actually dead. Again, this is a message to us in the room. It means that you can have the name of a Christian, but if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to have the life to back it up. You can have a good doctrine and a good theology. You can have a cross on your building and wear a cross around your neck. You can have a good statement of faith. You can be above reproach, but that's not the main point because the Bible says that the letter of the law will kill, but the spirit produces life. What does that mean? It means that you can follow everything doctrinally to be a Christian. And do you know what that's called? Religion. We can be good at religion. We can tithe, we can show up to church, we can volunteer, we can do all of these things. But another verse of scripture says that, listen, it's not good enough. How, well, he says, is, is how could we think that what God started in the spirit, we could ever finish in the flesh? He says, so the letter of the law will kill within its own. To go through religion, it'll kill with its, 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 itself. But when we have the spirit, which brings life, that's power. So we have to have the spirit behind the letter. That's God's breath. It's God's life. It's not good enough that you and I just know about God. We have to experience his power in our lives. Amen? The sixth church, the church of Philadelphia. This was a weak church. It says that they had little strength. There will be a temptation in the last day that the church will buy into the lie that they should just be a weak, powerless church in the corner somewhere. And the world will tell the church, well, just go to your little corner, do your little thing, and don't bother anybody, and leave us alone, and we'll leave you alone. And there will be some who will buy into that lie, and that's what the church of Philadelphia did. They bought into the lie that if we just remain silent, we just do our thing, we don't make any waves, then we will be okay. But Jesus is telling the church, listen, you, you can't be in the world and of me and not be bold. Why? Because the world will push us so we have our backs so far against the wall and little by little they will steal what God has called to give us. But he says the church has to be bold. They have to be courageous. It reminds me of when David went out to deliver some bread and cheese to his brothers. And you don't even remember Goliath was there and he was taunting, taunting David's brothers and the Israelite army. And the Bible says that they were hiding in fear of Goliath. That's that church of Philadelphia. Hiding in fear of the world. Hiding in fear of the adversary. And David walks into this thing. And he's like, what are y'all doing? We serve the living God. And he tells Goliath, like, listen, I don't care. I'll feed you to the birds. My God, he's, he's a big. Remember, where is he right now? He's the God sitting on the right hand of his throne. He's the God with fire in his eyes. He's the God that, who performs justice and miracles. He's the God who will ride in at the end on the great white horse. Come on, somebody. God's not dead. So the church can't be quiet and the church can't be dead. The seventh church was a lukewarm church. I heard somebody talking about this this week. And it was so good, I, they, they brought this, this teaching, and I never heard it this way, but they said, really, uh, in this city where this was written to, there were actually two main streams that came into the city. One was from a hot springs, and they used that water because it was hot. It would, they would use it for sanitation and cleaning wounds, and it was very vital to them. And then they had this cool spring stream that would flow into the city, and of course, they used that to quench their thirst. 
But somewhere along the way, these two streams merged, and now they didn't have hot water, and so there was nothing they could do for wounds, and it wasn't great water now for drinking. So he says, listen, one of the dangerous things that the church can face is lukewarmness, which is another word for indifference. You have ups and downs in life for sure. But indifference to spiritual things is dangerous. We have to stay hot for God, so to speak. In the last days, there'll be a temptation to not understand how important it is to be the kind of church that he's called us to be. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, and this is actually in the message translation. It says, at the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. How is God going to do what he does in the earth? Remember, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's going to perform it through the church. This is the church age. If there's something God's going to do in the earth, he's going to do it through you, he's going to do it through me. Nothing happens in the earth during the church age that God doesn't partner with his body in the church. That's why some people say, well, I love God, but I hate church. I hate the church politics, I hate church, I, I'm not about organized religion, I'm not about, you know, the whole thing. Very interesting that somebody could say that because they're missing the main point. Like, for instance, after church, husbands, in the car, I want you to look your wife square in the eye. And I want you to say, babe, I love your face. Oh, I love your face, but I don't like your body. <laughs> and watch how well that goes for you. I won't even look down at my wife even saying that. It's the same as somebody saying, I love God, but I hate the church. Because he said, the church is my body. So the, to the believers who would sit at home and say, well, I'm watching online. I'm a part of the church. No, 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 no. You, if you love God, you have to love his body. And they say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Yep, because why? Because a hospital isn't full of well people. A hospital is made for sick people. But even Jesus in his physical bodily form, there are wounds in his hand and on his side. And it reminds us that even the body of Jesus has wounds on it. There's a flesh side of it. But if I love God, I'm going to love his church. All right. I'm preaching that to the choir. You're here this morning. Come on. The church will have its problems. The church will hurt. Why? Because the church is filled with people. But it's the body and the bride of Jesus Christ. Try having a friendship with somebody, but you absolutely hate their spouse. It's not going to last very long. But the Bible says that this, the church at large, is the bride of Christ. So we've got problems, but I'm not going to mock the bride of Christ. I'm not going to condemn the bride of Christ. I'm going to jump into the bride of Christ, and I'm going to help it become the glorious bride that he said he's returning for in the last days. I'm not going to take my eyes off of the real prize here. I'm not, you understand what I'm saying? I, I got to keep my eyes focused that he, he's coming for the bride. The church is his bride. If I'm not connected to the bride... He's not coming for a cut-off finger laying in a field somewhere because they're too good to be a part of a local congregation. All right. So then he says, write about the things that shall be. In chapters 4 through chapters 22, we're going to read them all together. Are you ready? No, just teasing. I, I, got, I got one le yep out there. And of course, it's from Denny, the, the word man. He's like, yeah, let's do it, man. Let's read it. No, but he leans in in these chapters and he begins to talk about eternity. And it's a reminder to live with a mindset of eternity. That we're not here forever. Either we will leave this world one of two ways. 
Our physical body will give out, but our spirit will live on forever. Or he will rapture us and our spirit and body will go out of this world together. One of those two ways, you will leave this world. That's why when you got problems and you've got a circumstances and offenses, man, sometimes you just have to put it in light of eternity. Yep. All right, the business didn't work. Okay. When I am ruling and reigning with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth, which we'll get to later, it's not going to be like, yeah, I wish that internet marketing business really just took off. I just... <laughs> And you're not going to be standing there saying, you know, I just can't believe that they were mean to me and that they didn't like me. And you're not going to be running up to the throne of God saying, now, are you going to do anything about them? Because, you know, back when I was on the earth, they were really rude to me. And now they're here. Like, none of that stuff is going to matter. Actually, the Bible says that in, in the very end, when he creates a new heaven and the earth, the earth will be destroyed by fire. Two things. Let me just help those who would be leaning in heavily, heavily to global warming. It probably is true, and I celebrate it. Somebody's going to post this, and it's going to be taken the wrong way. But because it means the end is growing nearer. Because eventually, he says, fire is going to consume this whole people planet. Now, I do think we should be good stewards of the earth while we're here. Don't get me wrong. So if we can do something to help the earth, let's do it, because we've got to be good stewards of it. But don't be surprised when the world gets hotter, because the Bible says in the end, it's all going to burn anyway. But my mama always used to tell me that she would say, listen, you know, the car broke down, all these things. You know, you're, you spend your whole life and sacrifice your family to try to buy a bigger house and a bigger car. But the reality is, at the end of the day, they are all going to burn. I've told you before, I love junkyards with a passion, auto junkyards. And one of my favorite things, I'll walk around and I'll look at that old 1972 gremlin sitting there in orange. And I'll think to myself, one day, somebody saw that on the car lot and thought, my God, I'll work overtime. I'll do what I got to do. I'll sacrifice my kid's education. But that gremlin is getting in my driveway. And it's going to have an expected end. Someday it's going to be put into a crusher and made into this little cube. But family time was sacrificed for that gremlin. Well, probably not the gremlin, but, you know, I guess the gremlins were for those who value family time. You know, right? But you understand what I'm saying. Like if, if I could just get the bigger house and all of my kids could be spread out with our own room. Come on, push them all together and teach them about God. You know, if, if we just had the right car and the newest model, then I'd be happy. Listen, what are we sacrificing to climb the American dream and to build the American ladder? One day it's all going to be destroyed and what will remain is our faith in God and the faith that we've taught our family and how we stood on this earth and proclaimed the gospel. He says you will receive a crown in heaven for every soul that you've brought into the kingdom, not for every house that you bought and every dollar that you saved. I'm all about saving, but sometimes as the end comes closer, we just got to say, we got to further the gospel. We got to get the gospel to the four corners of the world because Jesus is coming and he doesn't care about your 401k. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Come on. But I'm saying that's not what we live for. There's no eternal value there. Doesn't transfer, right? Right? 